Good morning, Treeline Church, and welcome to Church at Home. We're so glad you're joining us online this morning, and we want to encourage you, as always, to engage. And let's be the church, and let's be community together this morning. We're not in person, but it doesn't mean you can't reach out and message someone or respond in the comments, or just engage however is best for you. So let's dive into worship this morning right now. Good morning, Treeline Church family, and welcome to Church at Home. We're so glad that you've joined us this Sunday, wherever you're watching, whether that's um, on your phone, on your tablet, uh, on your TV. Uh, We're glad that you're here with us (laughs) this morning. Uh, We're going to jump into a time of worship just like we do every Sunday, uh, simply just putting our mind's attention and our heart's affection on Jesus. So whatever that is for you, whether it's closing your eyes, maybe it's lifting your hands. Um, Some people like to journal. Uh, Maybe it's just focusing on the words on the screen, Um, but I just encourage you to fully engaged this morning. God wants to to connect with you, to meet with you, um, and he deserves our praise and our worship. So let's praise him today. Sing when the weight, when the weight of the world begins to fall. On the name of Jesus I will call For I know my God is in control And His purpose is unshakable It doesn't matter It doesn't matter what I feel It doesn't matter what I see And my hope will always be and your promises to me and now I'm casting out all fear Cause your love has set me free My hope will always be And your promises to me yeah. As I walk As I walk into the days to come I will not forget what you have done For you have supplied my every need And your presence is enough for me It doesn't matter what I feel It doesn't matter what I see My hope will always be And your promises to me And now I'm casting out all fear And your love has set me free And my hope will always be And your promises to me Your promises to me You will always be more than for me, come on, sing that to him. Come on, you will always be more than enough for me, and nothing's gonna stop the plans you made, nothing's gonna take your love away. You will always be more than enough for me. Come on, let's sing that again this morning. You will always be more than enough for me, yes, you will. You will always be more than enough for me Nothing's gonna stop the plans you made Nothing's gonna take your love away You will always be more than enough for me Doesn't matter what I feel Doesn't matter what I see My hope will always be your promises to me Now I'm casting out all fear For your love has set me free My hope will always be And your promises Doesn't matter what I feel It doesn't matter what I see My hope will always be And your promises to me now I'm casting out all fear For your love has set me free My hope will always be And your promises to me yeah. Your promises to me Your promises to me
Old things have passed away, and your love has stayed the same, and your constant grace remains the cornerstone. The things that we thought were dead are breathing in life. Again, and you cause your sun to shine on darkest nights. For all that you've done, we will pour out a love. This will be our anthem song. Oh Jesus, we love you, and oh how we love. The hopeless, the hopeless have found their hope. The orphans now have a home, and all that was lost has found its place in you. He lives, and you lift our weary head. And you make us strong instead And you took these rags and you made us beautiful For all that you've done we will pour out our love This will be our anthem song Jesus we love you We love you And oh how we love you And you are the one Our hearts are told And our affection Our devotion Poured out on the feet of Jesus in our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus in our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus in our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus we love you oh how we love you you are and you are the one our hearts adore oh, Jesus we love We love you, and oh, how we love you! You are the one in our hearts adore. It's so good to worship together. And even though we're not all gathered together, that we can still praise and worship our God. 
In the book of Hebrews, it tells us to bring the sacrifice of praise continually to God. And that was really interesting if you think about that, the sacrifice that sometimes you might not feel like worshiping God. You might not feel like singing songs. You might not feel like living your life in such a way that brings God praise. But sometimes it's a sacrifice, but we continue to do this. And it tells us that we do this because of what Jesus has done for us. We continue to bring the sacrifice of praise to him because of who he is and what he has done for us. And just like we sing songs and worship and praise to him, we also give of our finances as an act of worship to God, a sacrifice of praise to him. I want to say thank you for continuing to be generous as a church. It doesn't matter how much you give or what you give. We just want to say thank you for being generous and supporting the mission and vision of Treeline. There's a few different ways that you can give. You can go to our website at treeline.church and there's a link right there you can give. You can download the Church Center app, and right within the app, there's an easy way that you can give. And if you want to do some good old-fashioned analog giving, you can also send in a check. Our PO box is listed on the website under the Giving tab. You can find that there, too. However you give, whatever you give, thank you for continuing to be a generous church. We're going to pause and go over a couple of quick announcements and reminders like usual. And the first one is, as always, make sure you're just following us online on social media, on our website, on treeline.church. It's just the best way to stay up to date. We'll post announcements about what we're doing, if we're meeting in person, what's going on, what's new, and all the stuff we want you to stay connected with. Similar to our social media presence and web presence, we have a text messaging service. It's really simple to sign up. You just text TREELINE to 97000. We'll send you those same updates and reminders that we want to make sure you're aware about. Also, you can respond to those text messages and just let us know what's going on. Just send us prayer requests and information like that so we can keep in touch with you as well. Small groups have launched this fall at Treeline, and if you're not involved in one, it's not too late. You can still join one by going to our website, treeline.church, or signing up in the Church Center app. We can't encourage you enough to get connected, especially in this season. It's more important than ever. Now we're going to go to Brian with the message. And again, let's engage this morning to dial in and to listen to what God has to say through Pastor Brian to each one of us. Hello, friends, and welcome. So thankful that you're joining us today, no matter where you're at, where you're watching, if you're watching on your couch, in your chair, at the kitchen table, maybe you're listening to this podcast while you're driving in your car, wherever you are, we just want to say welcome. And we're so glad that you're joining us today. We are completing a four-part four part series called Under God with a question mark. If you probably noticed that it's in the middle of an election year and everything's crazy in the world right now. We've got a pandemic, social unrest. There's just a lot going on. And on top of all of it, it is also an election year. And so what we're doing is we're taking a little bit of time to talk about what it looks like for us as Christ followers to be also a patriot, to also be supporting our country. And that it's okay to have a political affiliation, that it's, that it's great to support and we should vote. We should do that civil duty. But before any of those things that we are Christ followers, first, that God has sent us as his ambassadors to this earth. And I really want to encourage you, if you missed any of the first three parts of this series, to go back and listen or watch them. I really think there'll be an encouragement to you as we learn what it looks like to truly be a Christ follower that is under God. So as we dive in today, we're finishing up this last part, and we've been kind of taking apart the Pledge of Allegiance and talking about some key words or phrases within it that we've been looking at from a Christian perspective or what the Bible has to say about it. And so in this last part, we're talking about liberty and justice. And really, we're going to change those words a little bit to something a little more biblical for us. But I think you will get it and maybe have to put your thinking cap a little bit on to get this translation. But I think you'll really enjoy this today. And honestly, this is something that's really important for us as Christ followers. So we're going to start in John 1. And I want to read you this passage, and it's kind of a popular one. You may have heard it before. It says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So here you see in this passage, it's actually talking about Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, that he was the Word and he became flesh, that he dwelled among us, that Jesus was here, and that he actually came full of two things. He came full of grace, and he also came full of truth. 
And so this is really important for us today as we talk about the person of Jesus and it's that in our nation, in our country, here in the United States, that more and more people are walking away from their relationship with God or wanting anything to do with Christianity and really becoming post-Christian as a nation. For years, people embraced Jesus in this nation and as time has gone on, that's become less and less true. Matter of fact, according to Barna Research, Right here in the Pittsburgh region, about 47 people claim to be post-Christian. Well, what does that mean? Well, if someone's pre-Christian, they haven't yet made a decision for Christ, or maybe they don't know. If someone is a Christian, then hopefully they're doing their best to follow after Jesus. And post-Christian would be, hey, I know about that Jesus thing, but I'm just no longer interested in following after God. I understand what it is, but I had some connection to Christianity, but now they're just simply rejecting it as not true. And 47% is a pretty high number. As far as all the cities in the United States, we were about in the top third of that list. Some regions went all the way up to 63% now listed as post-Christian according to this research. And as a nation, we average about 50% uh, of our nation, of our country now proclaiming that they, um, they know who Jesus is, they know about Christianity, they just simply don't care. Now, honestly, this is nothing new for the world. Um, Europe has been a post-Christian uh, for a long time. Um, and there's still good things going on there for God. There's still people who are working to bring the gospel, but by and large, the population has moved and shifted that way. And you can really tell this is true because um, many times in Europe, when you go to a cathedral, um, people aren't going to worship. They're going to take pictures because they're there as tourists. They're not there to, to worship God. They're there to see um, something that was once done in God's name and now has become a tourist attraction instead of something where people worship and follow after God. And so this is nothing new for the world. It's just kind of the United States has joined the party and caught up to the rest of the world and has moved towards this post-Christian society. See, faith in Christ has moved from being to the center of our culture and our society and has moved to the fringe. It has moved from being something that was predominantly seen as positive if you were a Christian to now some see negative or even threatening by some. It's moved from being something that was accepted and was the norm to something that's become the fringe and outside of our cultural norms and what is accepted and honestly something that's looked upon as being suspicious. It's a little sus, right? It's something that people just aren't sure about. Matter of fact, I don't know if you remember um, back in the 90s, there was a t-shirt. It was like, not ashamed of the gospel. Uh, you know, people were trying to make their stand and profess who they were in Christ. And, and even the word Christian has become so loaded. It's become so much baggage and weight that people hear the word Christian. And sometimes they're like, man, that carries not a good connotation. It carries some negative baggage. And so you'll even hear me in messages talk about being a Christ follower or a follower of Jesus or a disciple of Christ. And it's not that I'm a, a ashamed to be a Christian. I'm not ashamed of the gospel or Jesus whatsoever. It's just that when you're communicating, sometimes the word Christian, unfortunately, carries a negative connotation. The same thing is true with evangelical, that in our society, in our culture, evangelical is something that carries a negative connotation. It's people think of evangelical, and a lot of times it's tied to things like hate and bigotry. And it's really sad because being evangelical is just to simply believe the word of God and we believe the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and we want to share that with other people. But unfortunately in our culture, in our society, in the United States, it's come to take a turn to where it doesn't mean that anymore and it's carried some negative weight, baggage, some terrible connotations with it. And honestly, that's really frustrating and it's really sad. And now when you hear all of these things, it would be really easy to be like, well, Brian, aren't you overwhelmed? Aren't, isn't that like kind of depressing? Doesn't it make you sad or want to throw in the towel or be like, man, what do we got to do? And I think this is really important for us. And maybe you caught this in that first John that when the world gets darker, the light shines brighter. Come on, friends, when the world is the darkest, the light shines the brightest. And this is something that we can find encouragement in, that God is not overwhelmed. He's not scared. He's not shading his boots like, oh, no, what am I going to do? America is now moving towards being a post-Christian society. How will I ever get my will done on earth? No, God's not concerned at all that Jesus has come and his light will shine the brightest when it is the darkness. Jesus didn't tell us to hide from the world. He told us to go into the dark world and to make disciples. We're not just supposed to cut and run because things get difficult. We should go into the dark world. We should make disciples. We don't run from the culture. We influence it. And that's really key and really important. We don't run from the culture when things get difficult, when things get dark. We influence it. So how do we faithfully live for Jesus in a post-culture 
in a nation that is post-culture? How do we do this? How do we faithfully live for Jesus in a post-Christian culture? How, do we, how is it done? What does that possibly look like? And so I think really what it comes down to is a few things, but the first one is really important. This is something that we got to get, is that we should live with grace and truth. If we're going to follow Jesus in a post-Christian culture, we've got to start with this. We've got to live with grace and with truth. We finished this up in 1 John 14. It was the last thing we read. It says, the word became flesh. Jesus became flesh and his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of what? Full of grace and full of truth. Now, why is this amazing? Because typically it's really hard to be full of grace and truth. Honestly, people typically be, um, tend to be wired one way or the other. People typically are either really wired for grace or they're really wired for truth or they just lean one way more to the other. Or they're just naturally drawn to one or sometimes it has to do with your personality. But really, this is amazing that Jesus, the example who came for us to follow, the one that we're supposed to emulate to become more like daily, that he came in both, that he had grace and that he had truth. And honestly, that's become one of the biggest challenges because typically we lean too far one way or the other. See, truth, and maybe you know the voice of truth, and you've probably heard people like this, and they say things like, if the Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it, right? That, that's the truth voice. Or how about they, they really are always down on people telling them that, you know, you got to turn or burn. You know, it's all about the sins that you, and, and God hates the sin and he doesn't want you to do that. And he's a terrible person. And you they pretty much make all these really difficult things in order for people to get to God. You got to get cleaned up and do all these things. And that's the voice of truth. That's the voice saying that, um, you know, everything's got to be right. Everything's got to be just so in order to get to God. You got to fulfill all these things, jump through all these hoops. That's the voice of truth. And it's not a bad thing. It's just that when everything is tilted and slanted that way, it becomes difficult and it becomes unbalanced and creates a lot of issues. And the same thing is true about the voice of grace. And maybe you've heard this. This is like, you know, I love you. You love me. I'm okay. You're okay. We're all okay. Everything's fine. God understands. He knows. He knows your heart. He loves you as long as you're happy. That is just simply the tilted voice of grace. And they couldn't be any more polar opposites. Truth and grace. But here's what we've got to understand is that truth without grace leads to rules and rebellion. Truth without any grace will simply lead to rules and rebellion. Now, you know this is true because... <laughs> As soon as a rule is made, it's meant to be broken. That's what people say. Rules are meant to be broken. And matter of fact, we've even seen this and experienced this. And I experienced this somewhat younger in my Christian faith when I was a child. And I don't know what your experience was if you grew up in church or you're new to the faith. But a lot of times rules or legalism were a big part of that. They were the rules just for the sake of the rules. You weren't allowed to go watch any movies. Matter of fact, women had it really tough. There was no lipstick. Uh, you had to wear a skirt. You couldn't wear pants. I'm not making this stuff up. That was was actually thing that people who followed after Jesus, they said, if you're following after Jesus, you got to follow the rules. You can't go see any movies. I don't care if it's Bambi. You're not even allowed to go see Bambi. No movies at all. No lipstick, not even subtle shade. No, nothing. You can't wear it. Matter of fact, no secular music and absolutely no dancing. That was like the worst thing ever. There can be no dancing. And that's the legalism, the rules that came with truth without grace. And then the rebellion that comes. Rules are meant to be broken as soon as you make them. And if you've got kids, you know this is true. You know that um, kids know what is right and people will know what's right, but they don't care, right? And if you had children, especially young children, I don't know what it is about that like two-year-old age where they're really trying to test you and try you out and you're starting to lay down the rules and they begin to understand them and you can tell them, don't touch this one thing. Whatever you do, don't, don't touch it. And what do they do? They come over, look you straight in the eye, and they touch that bad boy, right? Because they want, to, and then what are you going to do about it? Or if you've ever tried to potty train a kid, oh, come on, someone, you ask him a hundred times, do you have to go to potty? you have to go to the bathroom? you have to go? No, no, no. And they'll look you straight in the face. No, I don't have to go. And then while they're looking you in the eye, they'll just pee their pants right there in front of you. It's like, come on, you just said you didn't have to go. Matter of fact, my wife and I, we had a funny incident um, recently 
We have a little dog named Maisie, a little white dog. She's normally white. Um, I walked in the living room one day and Maisie now has blue streaks on her. I'm like, wow, this is a nice accessory. What happened? I asked Christy, she's like, I don't know. And so we go into the kitchen and our little Cora, who is now four years old, is sitting at the table eating a snack. And so I asked her, I'm like, did you color on Maisie? And she's like, no, I didn't. I'm like, just tell the truth. Did you? And she looks me in the eye. She's like, no, I didn't color on Maisie. And so we're like, well, what color is she? And she's like, blue. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what color is she? And she's like, blue. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what color she is. She realized, I was like, oh, come on. This girl looking right at me, lying to us in the face that she didn't color, but somehow in a different room knows what color our dog is. Maybe she had a prophetic gift or something. I, I, I don't know. But it's just so true that we see this even in our children that without relationship, Without grace, just having rules, just having truth will lead to rebellion. Matter of fact, the quickest way to raise a rebellious teenager is simply to have rules without any relationship. See, truth is a good thing, but truth without grace coupled to it leads to just simply rules, empty religion, routine, and it can lead to rebellion. The second part is this, the opposite side of the equation. Grace without truth leads to do whatever and believe whatever. Grace without truth leads to do whatever and believe whatever. Now this is kind of a big issue because really grace unbridled without the truth with it becomes a license to sin. It's a license to do whatever it is that we want. It's saying things like God understands. It's your life. No one can tell you how to live it. No one can tell you what to do. No one has the right to tell you how to live your life. Matter of fact, even people who believe in Jesus can do this. It's saying, you know, I believe in Jesus and because I have him in my life, I can pretty much do and get away with whatever it is that I want to do. And that's something that's really frightening. That's something that's really disheartening is that sometimes people can just get a little bit of Jesus, just get a little taste of him and, and make and just enough to make us feel good, but not enough to truly begin to conform us to his image. Really not enough to, to begin to change us daily. It's like Jesus becomes this Adam. It's like he's a supplement or a vitamin that we take. And it's just Jesus, you know, everything else plus Jesus, just this little bit of add-ons. It's just enough to make us feel good about ourselves. But that's not what Jesus is about. Jesus didn't come to simply improve different areas of our life. Jesus came to give us a completely new life. He came to give us a completely new life. You could think about it this way. Um, sometimes, you know, and hopefully you do this, you go get the flu shot. And when you get the flu shot, where they just give you a little bit of that flu virus, not all of it, not enough to give you full-blown virus. Sometimes you might have a little reaction, but it's just enough to keep you from getting the full thing. And that's sometimes what happens to us as Christ followers when we get involved in church or we do just enough in our faith to just, just get a little taste, just enough, but we don't truly experience the full thing. And that's not what God has called us to. God doesn't want us to, he wants us to completely experience him. Jesus came to give us a completely new life. He's come to free us from the old life that has held us back. He wants us to live free and completely experience everything that God has for us. Grace without truth also leads to relativism. Relativism is simply just believe whatever. There's no single objective truth or capital T truth. It's everyone has their own truth, lowercase t truth. It's just my truth. And it says things long as long as I'm happy, that's all that matters. As long as you're sincere, it doesn't matter what it is that you believe. And finally, in this one, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone, it doesn't matter what you do. See, that is moral relativism. That's saying that there is no objective truth, that there's just simply my truth, your truth, and everyone has it. But see, friends, if there's only truth for every individual, then there really is no truth. See, we've got to have grace, but we've got to have truth coupled with it. We can't go too far the other way. And see, I think as you read this in 1 John, you see the order that they were listed it in. And I can't prove this, but it is very interesting that grace was listed before truth. I almost feel that like the author maybe put it that way because we're supposed to lead with grace. We're supposed to lead with grace first. That we can't cram our beliefs and thoughts down someone's throat, especially if someone's not following after Jesus. Friends, if someone has not made a commitment to follow after God and surrender their life to Christ, then we can't cram all our beliefs and thoughts and all the ways that God has asked us to live down their throat. We've got to start by leading with grace. 
Matter of fact, here at Treeline, my prayer and my heart for us is that churches, not even just our church, but all churches, that they would be a safe place for people to belong before they believe. Now, that can be really hard for people who are wired towards the truth side of the equation. But we got to take it a step beyond that. Is that church and tree line should be a place for people so that they can belong before they behave. Is that a lot of times people could come to church and they're going to be a hot mess. Matter of fact, Jesus himself said it is not the well that need a physician. It's the sick that need a doctor. And we should be a place with arms wide open that people can come in their mess. That they can come in their shame. That they can come in their questions and their doubts and their fears and insecurities and everything that they've got going on. They should be able to come and be a complete mess. And we should be able to welcome them with the grace and the love of Jesus. See, our message can't be change your behavior and then you can come be one of us. You can join our club once you get your life put together. No, friends, it can't be. Our message has got to be come follow Jesus and he will lead you into a life to help you experience it to the full. See, friends, there's a big difference between that. And that's something that we've kind of not got right all of the time. And as we live in a post-Christian society, and matter of fact, even deeper than that, people who have known Jesus and decided they don't want anything to do with it. The upcoming generations, Generation Z is the first generation in large, largest generation in our nation, and is also the first post-Christian generation. This generation has no idea of simple biblical truths. They don't know simple Bible stories. They don't understand things about grace and salvation in God and many of the things that you would have learned in VBS or Bible school or um, Sunday school or all those different things. They, they don't understand those simple things. They have no memory of the gospel whatsoever. The Christianity thing and this church thing is just a distant thing that they, they see, they don't understand. And this is really where our world and where our culture is moving. And here's what's really interesting is that post-Christian generations are incredibly skeptical about truth. Very skeptical about truth. Matter of fact, if you claim to know what the truth is, you're either one of two things. You're either arrogant or you're dangerous or you're simply both. They're very skeptical of what it is for truth. And here's what's amazing. Post-Christian generation, they aren't looking for certainty as much as they are just simply reaching out and searching for honesty. They just want to know that even in this Christian faith, and do you ever struggle Don't you ever have questions or doubts? Don't you ever wrestle sometimes and you see some of the arguments about science and faith and really wonder where, you know, this whole Jesus thing fits into that mix? Aren't you sometimes just wonder and struggle and even though you follow after God, isn't it it hard? Isn't it difficult? They're looking for some honesty. They're not even looking for someone who has all the answers. They just want to know that it's authentic. They want to know that you're living an authentic faith. And friends, if I could just be really honest today, That we as the church, the capital C church, we haven't always got this right. We've really sometimes gone down the other path of leaning too far. And honestly, if you don't like Christians, if you've been mistreated by them, I'm sorry. But if we're just being honest, I don't always like all the Christians either. Because we're all imperfect people. Even myself as a pastor, I'm a Christ follower, but I don't always get it right either. Sometimes I mess up. Sometimes I make a mistake. Sometimes I have leaned too far into the truth and not really had grace with it. And if we're not careful, this can become the default of the church where we simply just judge everyone on the outside and put them, hold them up to a biblical standard that they themselves have not even decided that they want to follow after. Friends, we not have always got it right. But here's the thing that I know about truth, is that truth isn't restrictive. It isn't repressive. It's not (laughs) oppressive. Matter of fact, it's the complete opposite of that. Truth is freeing. It's liberating and it's life-giving. See, even if you go all the way back and you think of Adam and Eve, the very beginning of the Bible, the first people that God created, what do you do? He creates this beautiful garden, the whole, whole earth, just a beautiful, amazing place with all these things, all these experiences, puts them in the middle of it. And then he makes this one tree. Don't eat from this one tree. Now, was he doing this to like suck all the fun out of everything that he did just to try to trip him up? No. 
He was doing it to give them life. He's saying, look at everything else. Look at all these other things that you can do and partake and eat. Matter of fact, be fruitful and multiply. He's like, hey baby, here's the garden. You're both naked, just have sex all the time. And it's a pretty good situation that he put him in. He's like, that one tree, don't eat from that. That leads to death. He was trying to set them up for success. He wanted them to experience everything that he created for them. And when you understand that truth is to protect us and to set us free, it's not to trip us up or hold us back. See, truth isn't just rules or morals. Truth is actually a person. It's not just a what, it's a who. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that he came to set us free so that we can experience life to the fullest. This is who Jesus is. Jesus is the truth. That he is a person. And that we can encounter and we can experience him. See, grace without truth is not a good thing. And it's just like I said that sometimes churches have slanted too far towards the truth side of things. If we can be honest, in more recent church history, churches have slanted too far sometimes towards the grace side. And it wasn't something that was on purpose. But see, back in the 50s, people, everyone used to go to church. It was just the cultural norm. You just went to church. Everyone went to church. There was nothing going on on Sunday morning. There wasn't little league sport this and everything else going on. I mean, it was just like you, you just went to church. Chick-fil-A weren't the only ones that were closed on Sunday. Everyone was. It was just what you did. In the 60s, that changed. People were liberated, became free, the hippies, the drug movement, free sex, all of that kind of stuff. Everyone's just kind of stoned through the 60s and people stopped coming to church. And in the 70s, they figured out, hey, people aren't coming back to church anymore. So in the 80s, what they began to do is try to find a a way for churches to become more relevant. In the 80s and 90s, and there was a movement towards churches becoming more relevant, preaching the gospel in a way that was relatable, that people got excited about. And I don't think it was intentional, but then it became something that became a little bit more of a movement towards the grace side of the thing when we weren't really proclaiming the truth. We didn't want to offend anyone. We didn't want to stick out or rub against the culture. We didn't want people to feel like they weren't loved and accepted. But then it became this slant towards just the gray side and this desire to become the cool church. And that's not our desire whatsoever. But I I think that what we've got to understand is that people aren't searching for cool. People aren't looking for a cool church to be a part of. If that was the case, all this post-generation and all these generations coming up that are not doing anything with church, all we'd have to do is set up a cool environment and they would be there. But that's not what they're looking for. They're not looking for a church that's cool. They're looking for a savior that is real. They're looking for a savior that is real. They're not looking to have all the answers. They just want to know that people are authentic and that there's a savior who actually cares about them, that loves them, and friends, that is relevant to their life. So who is this Jesus? Who is this real savior? He is the word that became flesh. He is God's son and he's full of grace and he's full of truth. Matter of fact, he confronted hypocrisy all the time. Jesus, when he was here and he actually comforted sinners, this was the truth and the grace side of him. And we see this in some examples that matter of fact, some of the harshest words and some of the more true things that Jesus had to say were for some of the people who were the religious leaders, the Pharisees who were supposed to be following after God, who were supposed to be teaching other people what it was like to follow after God. And he would tell them, hey, you're so concerned with the outside. You only care what people look at. You, you don't even concerned what God thinks about your heart. You guys are just a brood of vipers. He called them a bunch of snakes. That's right. Your Lord and Savior, your gentle Jesus called a group of people a bunch of snakes. That was the truth side. But at the same time, the grace side of Jesus, who meets a woman at a well who is living an immoral lifestyle. She's not living the way that God wants her to live. And what does he say? Does he call her a filthy sinner? No. He says, you know what? This water, yeah, you're thirsty, but if you drink from me, you will never thirst again because I am the living water. And he showed her grace. But then at the same time, he goes into his father's house, into the temple, and they're doing all these things where they're selling things and they're, and they're trying to, they're cheapening the faith. And he goes in, he starts turning tables. Jesus is flipping things over. He's got a whip. He drives people out. Jesus has a whip, probably that he made himself. This is the truth that Jesus came in. He's like, my house is supposed to be, my father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer. This is supposed to be about worship. And you've cheapened it and you just made it just about making money. This is not the father's heart. That was the truth that he was sharing. But in the same time that he had grace, that he invited a tax collector to come into his life, someone who was a criminal. And he comes over to his home and invites him on mission. Let's go change the world together. That's the grace that Jesus had. The truth that he had that he called out duplicity, hypocrisy, that he absolutely hated pretenses. That's who Jesus was. But at the same time, the grace that he had, that he loved the outcast. 
that he touched the untouchable and that he reached out and befriended the sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the cheats, the criminals, the grace side of Jesus because he displayed truth and grace so wonderfully. Probably the most popular story of Jesus really walking in this and displaying truth and grace in full display is the story of there's a woman. She's caught in the act of adultery. Caught in the act. Not like, hey, we heard about it. They literally catch her in the act of adultery. Yeah, that's right. We don't know what happened to the guy. He somehow got away. But the woman, they get her. They drag her out. The law at that time, according to Moses, said that she should be stoned to death. So they drag her out, probably partially clothed, bring her to the street. They draw a line. Here's the line. The law says she's supposed to be stoned to death. Matter of fact, Jesus, what do you say? What do you say? Should this woman be stoned to death? The law says that we're not trying to catch him up, right? They're trying to trick him up in this. And so instead of doing this, he gets down, doesn't say anything to these people, gets down in this woman's face on the ground and begins to write in the dust, write in the sand. We don't even actually know what it is he writes. The Bible doesn't tell us. Now, scholars will tell us that they think that Jesus began to write down the sins, the secret sins of these men who were her accusers. And it says one by one, they begin to leave. Can you imagine it thinking with these words he's writing? Well, he's not going to list my sin. Oh, there it is. Never mind. I'm out of here. And so as each of them leave without Jesus saying a word, he looks at this woman. He says, where are your accusers? Do none of them accuse you? And she says, not one, Lord. And he says, neither do I. Then he says, go sin all you want. Just don't get caught anymore. No, that's not what Jesus does. He now brings the truth side of the equation. Now that he offered her grace, he says, go and sin no more. Don't do that anymore. Jesus is this perfect display of truth and grace. That when there was a line drawn that said it was all about the truth, Jesus was willing to cross that line. And every time that religion drew a line, Jesus was willing to cross it. Jesus was a line crosser. You know why he was willing to cross those lines? It was because there was people on the other side who needed to receive grace. Friends, we don't draw lines to keep people out. We cross lines to bring people in. And this is that balance of truth and grace that Jesus offered to us. I think back to some of the people that I've had to encounter. And and honestly, It's frustrating sometimes being a pastor. I love what I do, but it's like anytime someone finds out that you're a pastor, they just, many people, if not most people, just don't feel comfortable being themselves anymore. It's almost like the principal effect or like the boss shows up on the job and everyone's got to be on their best behavior. It's like, oh, Brian's a pastor, you know, and they let a swear word out like, oh, sorry, pastor. It's like, you know, as I'm going to judge them and send them straight to hell, you know, but I appreciate people who can just be themselves around me. And I I remember years ago, fresh out of college and I'm being a youth pastor and there's this local subway that just opened up and so I'm there all the time and I'm taking students we'll meet for lunch and we'll go to the subway and there's this guy a teenager himself that worked at the subway and every time I would walk in I don't know how it happened but in a loving way which seems crazy he would just use all these profane words to say hi to me and he would call me all he was like I'd walk in he'd be like oh there's that bleep 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 you know (laughs) for the whole store I'm like how does this guy have a job like just flat out cursing out um, the people when they come in the door and and when I'd have students he'd do the same thing you know and and eventually I I don't know how many times I came in, um, you know, and he, as soon as you walked in with a student, you know, all the profane words would come out saying hi to me in a loving way, of course. And we're up there, we're ordering our sandwiches. And he's like, man, what do you always got these teenagers with you? What are you, a bleeping youth pastor? And it, just, that's exactly how he said it. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, actually I am. And he just like, the color just goes out of his face. I'm like, no, man, it's cool. He's like, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. I'm like, no, man, it's, it's all right. It's fine. It's cool. Just be yourself. And I remember just keep coming back and didn't treat him any differently to continue to build a relationship with him and let him know that you can just be who you want. Just offer grace. I wasn't like, oh man, how dare you call me that? I'm a pastor. You're going to burn in filthy. You're going to burn in hell. As a matter of fact, put a little extra cheese on there and then just go straight to hell. I mean, you're just a terrible human being. The same thing happened when we moved here. I began to work out of a Starbucks often. As a matter of fact, I kind of became the chaplain. I joked. I, I thought I was the chaplain of the Starbucks and got to know some of the baristas, got to know a bit about their life, their stories. You're just there working all the time, meeting with people. And there was this one who got to know that, hey, it was part of Treeline Church and would invite them to come. You know, we would hang up our flyers for our interest parties and the things that we were doing. And she's like, I can't ever come to that church. If I step foot in the church, the church would just catch on fire. I'm just, I'm, you know, I just can't. I can't come there uh, at all. And so the time went on and um, I walked in the one day and she's just like making this face at me. Like as I'm in line ordering, I'm like, man, what's going on? And so I get up to order and she's like, 
Um, so I kind of went on your church's website and I didn't realize you were the pastor. <laughs> and I'm like, so this is like changing everything? It's okay? I'm like, it's cool. It's fine. But what I really appreciate it is that things just continued and we were able to have that relationship and she didn't mind, you know, just being herself. And we really took care of her and the other baristas. And even you as a church were able to give them things for Christmas and really just love and support them and show them grace. That it wasn't about trying to be like, hey, you need to get everything together, act right, and then you can come to our church and hang out with us. But know that there's a God who loves you in the middle of the mess and the middle of the struggle that you're going through right now. And I'm so thankful for those opportunities that we have, and hopefully you have some people in your life that you can offer grace to, where it's not just trying to cram truth down their throat, but it's simply offering them grace so they can come experience who Jesus is. And friends, if you've walked away from the faith, and maybe you, you identify with that post-Christian number because you say that percent, I'm one of them. I'm one of people who have walked away, or maybe you're on the edge of saying, I'm just not sure if this organized religion, this Jesus thing, the Christianity, I just don't know if it's me. I just don't know if I can't do it anymore. And I don't know what the reason is. Maybe it was parents who you had who really were all about Jesus and church all the time, but then they just didn't live a life that really modeled it well for you. Or maybe you had a leader that you really looked up to, a Christian leader that failed or let you down in some way and it hurt you and it just turned you off to it. But here's what we've got to get to, is that people who walk away from Christianity, people who walk away from Jesus, they are rejecting a watered down, distorted view of Christianity. And if you could truly see Jesus for who he truly is, I truly believe that you would want to follow after him. If you could see who Jesus is, you would really want to follow after him. See, we are imperfect people. We are going to mess up. We are going to make mistakes. We're going to let people down. We are going to fail. Even as a pastor, even as a Christ follower, I'm going to fail people. I'm going to let people down. But Jesus will never let you down. He will never fail you. He came full of grace, a grace that was scandalous, that was undeserved, that was irrational. This lavish grace that Jesus showed showed us, even going to death on the cross, we didn't deserve his forgiveness. We didn't deserve his love, but that's the grace that he had. And then the truth that he also has, that he come and he wants us to experience all the truth that he can give us a completely new life, that he wants us to have truth, not to oppress us, not to drag us down, not to restrict us, not to take all the fun and joy out of life, but the complete opposite so that we can experience life to the full, so that we truly experience all that God has for us in this life. Friends, we have to model it just like Jesus did. Jesus came in grace and he came in truth. As we're following after Jesus, we've got to have both. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you. Lord, I thank you that you sent your son Jesus to us, who was full of grace and full of truth. God, that you offered us forgiveness and love, but then we experienced the truth that you are. And God, that we don't have to be suspect or suspicious of truth, but we can know that you came to give us truth so that we can experience life to the fullest. Lord, I thank you, Jesus. I thank you for the love that you have for us. I thank you for the forgiveness that you showed us and the truth that we're learning to live in your grace. God, I pray that you would help us just like you demonstrated grace and truth so beautifully. God, that you would help us to do the same. God, that we wouldn't just come in like a wrecking ball with truth. God, even though something might be true biblically, but that we would lead with grace. And God, that we wouldn't get so far on the grace side of the equation that we wouldn't forget to bring truth to the table. God, an understanding that truth is freeing and liberating. Lord, I thank you, Jesus. I thank you that you are with us, that you are for us. No matter what we face, no matter what we go through, Jesus, you will never leave us, forsake us, or abandon us. I thank you, Jesus. Friends, if you're watching today and you've never said yes to a relationship with Jesus, or if you're watching or listening today and maybe at one time you were following after Jesus and maybe you identify with a little bit of what I'm talking about and one time we're following after Jesus and now you're not anymore, I want to give you the opportunity before we go today. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Don't put it off till tomorrow. So maybe you feel that tug on your heart today, that today is the day that you need to surrender your life to him, to stop trying to do it on your own, but to accept the grace that God has given you, that you don't have to have it all together. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't need to know all of the things and all the scriptures and all that. What are those songs that they're singing? No, you don't need to know all any of that. You just simply need to be able to come and surrender and be like, I need Jesus in my life. I can't do this on my own anymore. So if that's you today, 
I want to give you the opportunity just to repeat this simple prayer after me and surrender your life to Jesus. Just repeat after me, dear Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you for giving your life for me. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my mistakes. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to follow you all of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, if you prayed that simple prayer, and more importantly, you believed it in your heart, you made the best decision you could have ever made. Matter of fact, the Bible says that when one person, just one, makes a decision to follow and surrender their life to Jesus, all of heaven is rejoicing and throwing a party in your honor right now. So if you would let us know that you made that decision, we want to come alongside of you and help you make some next steps to become a lifelong follower of Jesus. If you would send the word rejoice to 97000, we just want to come alongside of you, pray with you, thank you, and just help you and be a support to you and celebrate the decision that you made to follow after Jesus. Jesus. Friends, we're so thankful that you joined us today. If you missed any of the first three parts of this series, really encourage you once again, go back, take a listen, take a look. Really believe it will be encouragement to you during this election season as we look what it looked like to live under God as a Christ follower in this climate and culture that we're living in today. Thanks again for joining us. We look forward to connecting to you real soon. Jesus, oh Jesus, we love Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. Oh, Jesus, we love you. And oh, how we love you. You are the Again, we want to say thank you for joining us for Treeline Church at Home this morning. We realize you could be doing something else with your Sunday morning, but it means a lot to come together as community, even if it's not in person. I want to encourage you to continue that community, whether that's through making sign up for a small group or that's reaching out to someone and just having a conversation, whatever that looks like, let's continue to be the church and be community during this season.